at Lillian Bailey's school in South London, exam results are ominously close to the national challenge minimum. If they don't stay at or above 30% until 2011, the school could face closure. So, as many schools coast towards the holidays, the academic year begins here in June. Well, the idea, of course, is to get six weeks' progress out of the six weeks of this half term. And the best way you can do that is by telling them all starting a new year and new courses. Is it M I S S or M S? M I S S. Who else doesn't have a pen? All right, everyone, do you want to start filling in your planners with your timetable? Because it can take a bit of time. Yeah? Then everything we do on the 1st of September, we do on the 1st of June. The timetable goes. We give them new books, talk about the, the student promise and the, the school promise. All of that lost time in early September is got rid of. The GCSE students particularly like the feeling that they've got a six-week head start on everybody else in the country. Number two is humanities. Yeah. Do you think that there's a, a sort of dysfunctional effect on staff morale because they have to then gear up? Only, only the, there's only a dysfunctional effect on those people who need to find another job and don't understand the school ethos of getting the best for the children. And they shouldn't be here. Do you ever get any moans? Not that I hear. Normally, in most schools, you expect things to start winding down, but actually here they seem to accelerate to some degree. Um, you, you, the, the good thing about it is you, you, get, you cover what a lot of schools do in September now, and so when you come back in September, it is easier. Um, but it does mean that this week is, is quite hard. A good advantage about this system, though, is that Whereas most schools lose their year 11s, we lose our year 7s because the year 7s have moved up. So for half a term, there's no year 7 in the school. So if you happen to have a lot of year 7, which I do, it actually works out very well. The last time the school was inspected, it was judged to be good with outstanding features. But the same can't happen now because Ofsted have just moved the goalposts. Our next inspection result if we're inspected in the next year, two years, we'll probably say a satisfactory school with good and outstanding features. Whereas, full stop. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mr Scott, for those of you that don't know me. And uh, it's, I recognise most of you, but it's really nice to have so many people doing history this year and to have such a great group to be working with. So I'm really looking forward to this. What we're studying for the first part of our GCSE is the crime and punishment topic. Don't write anything down yet, OK? Just listen carefully. You're going to have three exams and you're going to do a, what's called a controlled assessment. It's a bit like piece of coursework. So the paper one, which we're going to start with today, is called Crime and Punishment. And it starts way back in the past, about 1450, and it goes all the way through today. So we're going to look at, we're not going to look at one period in history. We're going to look at lots of periods, lots of places, but we're going to focus on crimes and punishments. And protest, law and order. That's what we're going to do the second half. We're going to look at things like the Brixton riots, the poll tax riots. So there's going to be some local history, some history of this area when we do that. We're going to watch a little video clip and you're going to see why different people have committed crimes. But what I want you to do is take at least half a side in your book, use a ruler, please. I've got a couple of spares and draw down this table. So I want to see four headings, crimes and the reasons for different crimes. Punishments and reasons for those punishments. Good okay. afternoon. A reminder: we're now on Lillian Bailey's summer time, which means this lesson ends at five two. This is the first year we're teaching the crime and punishment. Well, first year for me. I normally teach the modern world, but the modern world's very difficult, and this is a easier, um, I think, more accessible topic, which is why we've chosen it. Pupils' achievement cannot cannot be significantly above pupils' attainment. So, it starts from the bottom. First, you start with pupils' attainment, and if it's significantly below national averages, it has to be inadequate. Once that's inadequate, the overall grade for achievement and learning can only get as high as satisfactory, which then means that the overall 
outcomes for individual groups, which then influences the overall effectiveness. So it all works up the pyramid. So once you've chalked up a four on attainment, you're not going to get three as your top number, your overall for your school. And that's what we're seeing already. Schools are being graded satisfactory with good and outstanding features. That's life. What Gary's saying is that from now on, schools whose A star to C GCSE scores are significantly below the national average of just under 50%, cannot be given an Ofsted rating of good or outstanding, no matter how good they really are. What I'm going to give you is a survey about what you think about different crimes and punishments. And this is your opinion, OK? One is you totally disagree, you think that's rubbish. Three is in the middle, you know you're somewhere, you sort of agree. Five, you think that is totally true, OK? You have five minutes, OK? And then we'll discuss what different people think. There's too many of them. I was wondering why I was... The other course, kids love it. I mean, it's about the Cold War and um, Vietnam and South Africa. It's great, but it's just very, very difficult. Um, so difficult in terms of...? The concepts are, you know, crime and punishment, it's quite easy to relate to, whereas the Cold War and communism, capitalism, they're quite abstract concepts, like, to get your head around. Um, so this is... It's more accessible. Standards, grades achieved. And it's four-level progress over five years, not two-level progress over a key stage. So, English, math, science, progress will continue to be sunny. Given the relentless emphasis on maths and English, will the prospect for science remain sunny? So you turn it, you see which way it lies, and you just pull it, so that, and you be very gentle about it. Until it's the top. Yeah? OK. Last one. What's the next one? Keep going up. What's the next one? I mean, no, 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 it's not there yet. It is. One and a half minutes. Stop. One point one again. One point one again. You feel the pressure. You feel the pressure from students telling you, well, this is no longer important. And we know we're important, um, but we're no longer treated as such. Um, by the students, so we have to do quite a lot of fancy footwork to keep them um, interested in the subject. And you know, why, why do students say to you it's not important? Well, it's publicised as not important. It's in the press. It's it's always English and maths, and um, they've just bought into that. The number of times I've been told that by my GCSE students is is just countless. Martha. I can't feel those eyes burning. I can't feel all the eyes on me. Are they taller? Okay. We have number of pulleys. And we also have the effort. Can anybody tell me which one of those will go on the horizontal axis, the X axis of the graph? Marcia? Effort will go on the, at the top. Let's use the word, shall we? We'll go on the... Y axis. On the y axis, you put effort, and on the x axis, put number of pulls. Number of pulleys. So, okay, we'll put effort here. What will not be sunny is standards. Because even though they are rising, they're not rising close enough to the national averages yet, because we don't have a national average intake. However, if I was a head teacher of a grammar school, I'd be cracking open the champagne. <laughs> Three quarters of students receive free school meals and a half have some form of learning difficulty or disability. These pupils receive four extra periods of literacy each week. Next to the side chip. Testing, testing. Usually we only have about 15% of students arriving with a reading age of their chronological age or older. And then we have the other students whose maybe reading age is maybe one year or two years lower than it should be, and we'd class those as average students at this school. And then we have the rest who perhaps have a reading age which doesn't actually um, figure on the scale. It begins at six, six point naught. Um, and some students don't even achieve that, so they're, they're down as having a reading age of below six. All right, let's hear it. Let's and hear they it. need an awful lot of help indeed. Sure. 
le ne re sa fa no. Not fa, is it? How do we say my name? Rowan. Not Rowan, no, Catherine. Right? What about the last one? No. OK, Josh, you can try the next row for me. I, I, O, O, U. My umbrella, it's raining. Ah, right. These children were practically unable to write their names, some of them, when they began. And now we can proudly write our names, we can type things on the computer. I can't answer as to why it's happened, because all of the families of these children that I've met are very, very supportive of education. They are parents who care about their children. They are very pleased with the work we're doing here. They are re they're very relieved. They're very relieved to see that action is being taken. That's the message I'm getting from parents, that there is a sense of relief. Yes, something is happening for my child. Shh. Yes. Shush, Next one. Mm. Well done. Tony, come up and test the boys. No, I'm a big boy. Thank you. Ooh. As you're my manager, I need, I need assistance. Thank you, Tony. Josh. Ha, ja, pa, qua. They've done it because you can't have... Ofsted report saying schools are good or an outstanding when the DCSF through National Challenge is saying that they're not good and outstanding. And so it's about the three-legged table balancing of Ofsted, Ofsted's data analysis and the department's policy. And Ofsted's data analysis won't change, but how it's used and applied by the inspection criteria, uh, inspectors will, and it now matches up very nicely with what the department is saying, which is driven by politicians. Now watch out, see as many buildings as you can see, all right? Come and sit here, come and sit here. Year eights are studying rivers and taking a boat trip to the Thames barrier. Right, everyone should have the Houses of Parliament and London Eye, London Eye, all right, it's good. This inspection framework was the first one which challenged middle-class coasting schools. And they're throwing it away? Yeah. Well, in some ways, they're right. It's, the system isn't about improving outcomes for middle-class children, is it? In some ways, it is about improving outcomes for these children. Telling us it's standards which really matter and nothing else, maybe they're right. <laughs> Now, this is a nice building here, this glass one. I think that's Nobody nice. got a job on better CVA, did they? This is a very famous building you're going to see. What? Does anyone know this building? I know these places. I know these places. I know these places. Tell Can't have it both ways. But if you're, going to, if you're constantly going to reference to national norms, then something needs to be done nationally to ensure more equitable intakes if you're going to measure schools against their standards, not against the progress travelled.